This is D3.2 on inheritance, specifically applications and inheritance, and this is all standard level content. We'll be talking about several examples, real life examples of inheritance, and the first one being something called PKU. PKU stands for phenylketonuria, and it is a recessive allele caused by a mutation in a gene that codes for an enzyme. This enzyme converts the amino acid phenylalanine into tyrosine. So both of these are amino acids. And what's important here is that you understand the inheritance pattern. Because it is recessive, in order for a person to actually have PKU, they must have um, two recessive alleles. They must be homozygous recessive, which means that both of their parents need to have at least one copy of that recessive allele. Now, from a physiological standpoint, PKU is actually very interesting. If you've ever seen little babies, um, as soon as they are born, they usually prick their foot or their finger to get a droplet of blood. And this is to do a test for PKU. Any babies who have PKU cannot drink breast milk, and that's because breast milk contains the amino acid phenylalanine. Since this baby cannot produce the enzyme to convert phenylalanine into tyrosine, phenylalanine builds up in the blood, and this can cause many problems with brain development and other severe effects. So again, this is an example of a disease caused by a recessive allele. So when I think about humans, most of our DNA is actually identical. That's right, you and I are mostly identical. There are only a limited number of spots in our genomes where we actually have different base sequences, and those are called SNPs, SNPs, single nucleotide polymorphisms. So these are positions on a gene where we can have different base sequences, and of course this signifies different alleles. And so when we're talking about alleles and their effects, not only can they affect a single individual, um, but we wanna also keep our eye on the entire gene pool of a population as well. In a lot of examples, you may hear alleles like very simplified, right? And we've done that a little bit too. We've said, oh, you can either have a dominant allele or you can have a recessive alleles. But the reality is that we can actually have multiple different alleles for the same trait. It doesn't just have to be two. There could be a lot to choose from. Keep in mind that each individual can only inherit two alleles, but what I'm trying to say is that there are more than choose to, two to choose from. So for example, there's an S gene in apples, and there are actually 32 versions of that gene, so 32 alleles. Each individual inherits two of them. So I might have one individual apple that has like S15 as one allele and S31 as another allele, while this other apple has S2 and S19 as their alleles. Okay, so very different genotypes here because there are such variation in the possible alleles. When you mate together individuals with different combinations of alleles, that is how we create different varieties. If they are producing fertile offspring, they're still the same species, but having a large diversity in the number of alleles, of, of alleles helps us to create really distinct varieties within that species. Another example of a trait that has multiple alleles is the blood group. So for humans, um, we have three different types of alleles that code for uh, blood groups, and it's very important that you write them in the correct notation. So the type A allele is written like this, I with an A exponent like that, or a person can inherit the type B allele, and it is written like this. Or a person can inherit a type O allele, and it is written like this, okay? Now, it's written like this on purpose. A and B are co-dominant. 
Now, be careful. If you are asked to define codominance, a lot of students fall into the trap of thinking, oh, that means they are both dominant. The correct way to define this is that codominance means both alleles are expressed in the phenotype. So we'll talk more about what that means in terms of blood group in a minute. Type O blood is recessive, so that's why I'm writing it with a lowercase i. You may remember from another topic that you studied that these different blood groups have different antigens on the outside of those blood cells and then group O no antigens. So let's talk about the different phenotypes and genotypes I can get here. So I have three different alleles to, to, um, that are possible to inherit, right? Type A, type B, and type O. So one combination I can have is two alleles for type A, and the phenotype would be type A blood. I can have a type A and a type O, and since I, or since O is recessive, this also yields type A blood. I can have, let's see, a type A with a type B allele, and this gives me type AB blood. So this is what it means to be codominant. Both are expressed in the phenotype. This individual will have both A and B antigens on the outside of their cells. A person can have two alleles for type B, and they will have type B blood, okay? A person can have a type B and a type O, and since O is recessive, that will also be type B blood. Or a person could have two alleles for type O, and then they will have type O blood. So I want you to notice a few things here. First, genotypes are combinations of two alleles, okay? And I have three alleles to choose from, so that's why I have so many different combinations here. Phenotype is the physical expression, so this is what type of blood a person has. Now we're going to do a Punnett square or a Punnett grid um, to see what kind of offspring we might get from a mother that has type O blood and a father with type AB blood. So the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to set up my Punnett grid like this, and I need to write the parental um, genotypes around the outside. I wanna pay attention to their gametes. So this mother with type O, the only way to be type O, and I don't even need that line, the only way to have type O blood is if your genotype is little i, little i, okay, homozygous recessive. So that means half of the mom's um, eggs will have this allele, and the other half of the eggs will have this allele. So I'm going to set up my Punnett square like this for the mom. The dad has type AB blood, and the only way to have type AB blood is to be heterozygous like this. So half of the dad's sperm will have this type A allele, and the other half will have the type B allele. I can fill in my Punnett square to simulate the fertilization between the male and female gametes, and this will give me all the possibilities for my offspring. So I'm noticing that about half of my offspring will have type A blood, okay, so type A, okay, and then half of them will have type B. Okay, so I'm actually going to rewrite this in a ratio, and so two of them will have type A, two of them will have type B, and I'm going to reduce that to a one-to-one -one ratio. So I would expect even numbers of type A and type B, and what's really interesting to me about this family is that it is not possible for any of the offspring to have a blood type that matches either the mom or the dad, so very cool. So we've talked about just regular, dominant, and recessive, and we've also just talked about co-dominance. And you may have already noticed I was writing those letters for the genotype a bit different. When we have a gene that is just dominant or recessive, we've been using capital and lowercase letters. 
For co-dominance or incomplete dominance, we use different letters. So I would use something like A or B, or in this case, I'm going to use W and R. They are both uppercase and they are different letters. And so when we're seeing that, that's an early sign that this is a gene that does not have a typical dominant and recessive uh, pattern, um, that this is either incomplete or co-dominance. In codominance, both of those genotypes were expressed in the phenotype for a heterozygous individual. In incomplete dominance, the heterozygous individual will have an intermediate phenotype. So for example, here in the four o'clock flower, pure breeding colors are white and red. So these individuals are going to be homozygous. Well, not for red like that. These individuals are either going to be homozygous for white or homozygous for red. A heterozygous individual okay, will have an intermediate phenotype. So in this case, pink. If they were co-dominant, then the heterozygous individual would be something like white and red spots. But in incomplete dominance, we're going to have an intermediate phenotype in the heterozygous individual. So we've got just regular dominant and recessive. We've talked about multiple alleles. We've talked about co-dominance. We've talked about incomplete dominance. We're gonna round out this video with some examples of a different type of inheritance called sex-linked genes. So first, let's talk about sex chromosomes. So for humans, and we'll limit this to humans, our sex chromosomes are our last pair of chromosomes and they are non-homologous. Homologous chromosomes are like this one. You have one from the mom and one from the dad. They have the same genes in the same location, but maybe different alleles. The sex chromosomes are not homologous because they do not have the same genes. So there are two versions of sex chromosomes for humans. We have the X chromosome and the Y chromosome. The X chromosome is larger the Y chromosome is smaller. So here you can see an individual that has two X chromosomes. If this individual had an X chromosome and a Y chromosome, it would look more like this. The Y chromosome is much smaller than the X. Biological females have two X chromosomes. They inherited one from their mom and one from their dad. So like this individual here. Males have an X chromosome from their mom and a Y chromosome from their dad. So they have an XY genotype for their sex determination. And we'll illustrate that through a Punnett square. So you can draw this along with me if you want. So let's say a biological man and a biological woman have a baby. What is the probability that their baby is a boy, let's say, okay? Well, if I'm thinking about biological males, their genotype is XY, and that means half of their sperm will have an X chromosome and half of their sperm will have a Y chromosome. They segregate during meiosis. A female is XX, so half of her eggs will have this X chromosome, and half of her eggs will have this X chromosome. So when I fill in my Punnett square, like so, I'm going to notice that half of my individuals are female. Okay, so we'll circle them here. So these are female and half of them are male. All right, so it's a 50-50 chance of having a biological male child or a biological female child each time. What's interesting here is that the sex determination for humans is based on the father. So females can only donate X chromosomes. What differentiates female offspring from male offspring is the male and whether or not he's, his sperm carries a Y chromosome or an X chromosome. Inheritance of genes that are on the autosomes, so those first 22 pairs, not the sex chromosomes, those follow regular patterns of inheritance that we've already discussed. However, there are genes on the sex chromosomes that we need to be aware of because they do not follow the same inheritance patterns. They are considered to be sex-linked genes. 
Again, those are genes present on one of the sex chromosomes, either the X or the Y. And because of that, they, are, um, they will affect males and females in different proportions, and we have a special way of writing them. So I'll tell you only about um, sex-linked genes that are on the X chromosome, because we'll find most of our examples there. So I would write them as an exponent on the X chromosome. So the X chromosome can carry the dominant allele, or the X chromosome can carry the recessive allele, if it is a trait that is only found on the X chromosome, then the Y chromosome does not have that allele at all or any allele, so we leave that blank. Okay, so we'll look into this further when we get into applications into things like hemophilia or red-green color blindness, but I just want you to be aware that there are um, other patterns of inheritance to be aware of when genes are located on those sex chromosomes.